Dames en heren, het is weet snel. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the digital conference organized by the Ministry of Finance, Building Anti-Fraud Crowd Immunity. My name is Artsu Zulin. I'll be jointly with you today and also tomorrow, the second day of the conference. We have had two uh, very effective, substantive panel discussions in the first part of the day uh, uh, on the significance of the topic, both as in Latvia and at EU level, where the cooperation was emphasized inside the country and also between the EU institutions, also between the representations of the states. We spoke also about so-called red flags, both as in terms of uh, processes in different fraud types. Also, this cooperation was emphasized again. And the topic which goes beyond both parts, it's about IT, uh, IT support for detecting frauds, uh, IT as a creator of new risks. And now this third part will be devoted to technologies as a tool to detect and prevent the potential fraud. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to remind, although this is digital conference and we watch more than uh, interact, still uh, we are very much welcome your comments, your questions in the chat room uh, on Facebook or here in Zoom. You can also follow this conference in English and in Latvian, uh, mainly this part of the first day, the ones watching in the Zoom room. At the bottom of the page, you can see this division, English and Latvian. Choose the one uh, you prefer. The ones watching us on other platforms, there's only Latvian version on the Financial Minister's website. There will be also links uh, to both versions, Latvian and English version. Let's begin our third block, third panel. We will begin with the presentations, followed by short question and answer session panel discussion, where we will conclude uh, all the open questions and to conclude this topic on technologies. And as the first, it's my pleasure to invite uh, Deputy Director of the Rural Support Service, Mr. Indulis Abolinch, who will share his experience on the use of satellite images um, in monitoring agricultural activity opportunities. So, Mr. Abolinch, uh, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome you here at this conference. Uh, today, it's a rem remote opportunity. And I will tell a bit how we use these uh, distant tools in order to monitor um, agricultural activities. So, I will tell a bit how we use these tools for the monitoring of the activities and what are the future opportunities. Uh, basically, this is a demand driven product. There is this EU program, Copernicus program. That several satellites um, move around the Earth, and then, and basically, there are images from Cosmos, and anyone can use them. One of the principles is that satellite images are accessible, free of charge. Uh, it can they can be used in Latvia, in any other country, in any other part of the world, uh, not related to the EU. Uh, the satellites. Uh, you can use for any purpose in Australia. Uh, basically, monitor everything what happens around the world. We call them Sentinel satellites, and we are using the first two ones, Sentinel 1 and Sentinel 2. Sentinel 2 makes the images of the surface. Uh, it's optic. Uh, there are consequent images uh, on the taking pictures uh, every five days on a clear days for agricultural purposes. Uh, these are available starting as of April until approximately October. 
the uh, Sentinel-1 date. Uh, this is a radar-based sensor, so there is a signal. And that's the way how it can recognize the typical characteristics for the surface. And the positive value of this type of data, it can work during the night, also in a cloudy weather. Yeah, no, maybe there are some things which can influence also this signal, but still this is quite a useful. Now you can see clear visual how it technically works that the satellites just surround, make the images around the globe, the Earth, and within this Copernicus program all these pictures are being saved and they are available free of charge, you can download them and also to analyze the data. So where can we use this huge amount of data? So Sentinel-2, once per week, uh, that's the whole Latvian territory when the image is made. The resolution, the resolution is approximately 10 to 20 meters, depending on the bar. No, it means private household, it's, it's just a few pixels. Yeah, so using this relatively pixel, still he can recognize what happens on the ground. But uh, having parallels with this artificial intelligence, uh, we can get uh, the information on the, um, basically basic information for identifying uh, crop cultures, identifying land, uh, management, moving, plotting, determining uh, tough burning. We can see this image which keeps changing on the right side. So the image, the picture we can see, it's a timeline. For these Sentinel data, the positive impact is that on the left side you can see there is also this infrared light. So not only we can see with our own eyes, but also this infrared is accessible. But there is a clear land, there is a red one, when there is vegetation there will be green light. And in order, uh, basically the principle how to recognize these uh, crop cultures, there is a kind of footprint in every step of its uh, life cycle. So analyzing similar cases, intellectual, artificial intelligence uh, can make this the detection between the different cultures, shrub seed, grassland, that is uh, so we can use it for uh, to support our work, we can analyze the data. Uh, basically, if those crop uh, which have been declared by the agriculture sector, uh, whether they are taken care of, whether they have been de developed appropriately, and of course there is some kind of precision, uh, we can speak about, so for rapseed it's approximately 94%, for winter wheat that's approximately 86 but for some cultures it's less, uh, for example 70% for barley. Uh, so there are uh, some examples in order to recognize uh, how other crop cultures look like. No, uh, there can be higher or lower precision, still we can have a risk analysis in order to compare um, the crops, whether those which have been declared, whether it really grows there. I think it's a good basis to ask a question to the agriculture, whether that's really the thing you have declared or it's other type of crop culture. Perhaps he has uh, made a mistake. If there is no response, 
Uh, if there's no response, perhaps we should go and check on site, just in person, if the information which has been provided is true. And it means uh, we implement our controls in the places where there are grounds to do so, not as it was done previously, just uh, for some 5% of the total area, but now we can monitor everyone, but we can check only those places where the results, uh, where there's clear discrepancy between the results and the, what is declared. And this is the principle, uh, uh, um, basically do it uh, or warn before you punish. Of course, there are different violations uh, which are allowed. Uh, while cultivating, and as you can see from the images that's related to last year's grass or touch fires, as you can see in 2019, that was prior to the fires. Nothing uh, can be noticed there. On the 22nd February, you can see a dark spot there. This is an indication that there has been a touch fire. And so you can apply uh, the punishment for violation. And it means a decrease in the payments. The second type of data are these radar data, Sentinel-1 data. It's similarly there, free of charge. Anyone can use these data. No, there is less opportunity really to recognize different cultures. Uh, and, uh, uh, for example, there have been rains, uh, clouds, and it's hard to obtain the right data. But uh, radar data are, are always available and uh, no impact from the weather side. There is no colorful image. There is simply black and white. Uh, and you can understand whether it's flat, whether there is hill, um, it's about um, the humidity and etc. And based on the real life examples, uh, the experts can understand. So this radar based, we can identify whether there is activity or, or there isn't. And if during the season we see there hasn't been any activity, it means that the agriculture hasn't been active. Uh, it, uh, the actions haven't been taken according to the cabinet of ministers and support cannot be provided. And basically uh, the commitment hasn't been commitment. We have also example from uh, the pumpkin field, where we've had quite a long discussion with the producer why in August, uh, we, uh, when going to the exact uh, household, we, we see they are very small, we, we cannot see their appropriate uh, size. So it's clear that somewhere mid-June before LIGO, Yani, there hasn't been any agricultural activity there hasn't been plotting, and the first activity can be determined just after LIGO or midsummers. And it's just, it's unfortunately just in the middle of summer. And it means that this person hasn't uh, followed uh, the time limits. Uh, the field hasn't been plotted in a timely manner. No, of course, everyone can, can do as he or she wants, but uh, it's sure that there are different cultures, crops, and, and EU uh, financial support can be uh, quite significant. And if you speak about biological pumpkin fields, then it's about 1,050 euros per hectare. 
in, in subsidies. And uh, of course, these violations uh, shouldn't take place. We should avoid these uh, payments to be made if the activity hasn't uh, been carried out. So this test uh, provides good tools for us for the regular monitoring, but also when there are some uh, disputes uh, between the parties, we can go back to some historical moments, other precedents, uh, what has happened. So I must say, that's why it's a good instrument. For example, this year we can compare to previous years. And so using these data and having data analysis, we can go uh, quite far back historically. Satellite keeps its movement. We can go back to somewhere 2014, 2015. So what are the main conclusions? So the instrument uh, provides the opportunities for the preventive uh, activities to avoid mistakes. Uh, monitoring also provides the opportunity to check all the uh, potential uh, recipients. But of course, still work needs to be done to improve the algorithm as such. And we have spoken in the Commission how to use these methods in the next period. And the Commission wants to say, to put it as an obligation to all the EU member states. But at the same time, there are significant concerns from the member states, how it will look like that uh, uh, we will not be able to determine everything with very high resolution. Uh, uh, we saw from, from different cultures, there were cultures we can determine up to even more than 90%, for some that's less. And I think at EU level and also at Latvian level, still a lot of work has to be done uh, to get exact guidelines and procedures, how to do it. Um, and this is one of the questions, uh, what is the trust level or what should be the trust level to ensure uh, this usage of EU finance resources? I think it's not possible to monitor 100 with 100 precision. It's, it's probably better than 5% with 100 precision. Thank you for your attention. I think uh, uh, we might have some questions in the uh, later the day, but quite an interesting presentation. For your um, presentation. And uh, it turns out it's a pumpkin field. This is our very interesting session that we are expecting to talk about technologies and how they are working. Thank you once again to Mr. Indus Arbolinch. And let's turn to our next speaker. We'll hear the experience of Bulgaria, experience with remote controls and IT tools. Um, and the presenter is uh, the representative of Ministry of Transport, Yasten Marko. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for touching me the floor. First, I would like to express my appreciation for being invited to this uh, panel event. And, uh, to, to tell you that this is uh, an event that will help us as well in our fight against fraud and irregularities. So thank you very much. Some, uh, some other uh, members of my team are also attending uh, via Facebook. So uh, as I said, uh, it will be a really interesting input for us. So I would like to start by sharing uh, the presentation. That I prepared for, for today. So, the topic is about uh, experience with remote controls and IT tools in road projects. Uh, first, uh, let me tell you what we will be speaking about in the next 15 minutes. First, to provide you with a little bit of content. Uh, what, what are we doing? What are we concerned with uh, in terms of the transport infrastructure? Uh, then some information about the remote controls and IT tools during the construction phase uh, of the road project. 
And then uh, some words about uh, remote controls during the exploitation phase. Uh, here I will speak about SCADA, system for monitoring of the traffic, and the TOL system, which was recently implemented in Bulgaria. Uh, so some few words about the context. This is the map of the Trans European Transport Network. Um, most of you are aware, I believe, of it. So here at the right down corner, uh, in brown, you see the East Mediterranean Transport Corridor, which passes through Bulgaria with uh, its two branches, or, or uh, let's say three branches. And uh, when we speak about the use of EU funds, uh, we, what we do here in Bulgaria is developing, mainly developing the transport infrastructure along uh, this corridor. And uh, we are receiving uh, new funding uh, already from pre-accession from 2000, yeah, 2000 up, to, uh, up to today with the fusion fund. So a lot of investments have been made. Uh, in this programming period, the main projects are uh, in, when we speak about the road infrastructure, through a motorway which connects Sofia with the Greek border. And we, when we speak about railway, uh, we are developing uh, the railway connection from Sofia to Plovdiv and uh, some part of uh, signalization and some other system of the Plovdiv to Burgas uh, direction. So this is shortly about the operational program. The operational program has a budget of around 2 billion euro. And uh, this is shortly about the program. And now, uh, changing the scale and uh, going uh, closer to, to Earth uh, after the very interesting uh, presentation about Sentinel uh, satellites uh, from Mr. Indulis Adonis, I would like to speak about the use of drones in Bulgaria. First, a few words uh, to put this in, the, in context, a few words about integrity facts. Uh, in Bulgaria, there is one project uh, which is uh, part of the pilot uh, project of the integrity packs. I, I, as you see on the map, Latvia is as well one of the pilot countries. So uh, perhaps you are well aware about this initiative. So I include only, only the link uh, about the initiative at EU level. In integrity packs in, in Bulgaria, uh, they're observing uh, one of the biggest projects, which is uh, the construction of Jelenica Tunnel, which is part of the lot 3.1 of Spruma Highway, which I mentioned in the previous slide. And what, uh, what is uh, done as part of this uh, integrity pact, uh, the experts, which are part of Transparency International Bulgaria, the branch of Transparency International, they they produce progress reports, comments, recommendations. Uh, they also have access to almost all project documents, participating monthly and other meetings. And uh, lastly, but not uh, but not at the last level, so it's uh, important. They use drones for monitoring of the progress of the of the project. So uh, this is, uh, let's say, one of the purposes, uh, one of the let's say one of the means that you can use uh, drones and it is done by uh, this third party um, participant in the construction process in Bulgaria. So a few words about Struma motorway. Uh, you see here uh, in yellow, this is the, the entire Struma motorway. And uh, in the red, in the red is uh, part which is still to be constructed uh, and here, at the top uh, part of the, the red section, uh, we are uh, constructing at the moment. It is uh, around 130 kilometers, and uh, the total value is uh, a bit more than 1 billion euro, so quite a big project. There are some more information about this. Total value only of this section is 380 million, but uh, some other sections have been uh, implemented before then for this program period and still some are pending, mainly the one in uh, red. So uh, when we speak about the use of drones, uh, there are, uh, let's say, uh, different uh, other 
users of roads in, in Bulgaria. Um, the managing authority of the operational program where I am situated at uh, also uses drones and I would like uh, to try here to, to share with you uh, sorry not this one This is uh, this is the picture of uh, this is the picture of the uh, to current dimension. So just to, to give you uh, an idea about the project, this is actually uh, the longest uh, tunnel in Bulgaria, uh, in road, road tunnel in Bulgaria that is uh, currently under construction. It will be two, two kilometers. Uh, per cube, so all together 4 kilometers. So you see here the, the approach is here that, uh, for uh, the tunnel. And uh, this is uh, the Struma Valley. It's a very picturesque uh, place, uh, as you can see. Uh, and uh, this is the part uh, again from the project. But, Motorway. So uh, this is uh, one of the one of the trips uh, that, that were made by the by the managing authority uh, by the managing authority uh, using drones. Also, there are uh, some other examples of use of drones. Uh, we have here in Bulgaria the phenomenon that. Uh, a lot of citizens uh, are interested and uh, just uh, just do it uh, by themselves, uh, by their initiative. Uh, they use drones on different uh, projects, uh, role projects. And here are links, I, I will not uh, open them, but uh, here are links to some of the projects uh, where the citizens uh, have used drones for monitoring the, of the progress of the, of the project. So this is about the use of drones. Uh, uh, currently, uh, what we do, let's say, but we are aware that uh, a, lo a lot more can be done, and the data uh, that uh, that is captured by the drones can be analyzed by big data and so on. But uh, this is something for the future. Uh, so uh, we're talking now for today. So this is for the moment. Uh, a few words about an IT tool, Arachne. I, I believe that uh, most of the audience uh, is aware about this tool. So we use this uh, restoring tool for mainly for two purposes uh, for the moment. For the planning of on the spot check. So we extract uh, information about the risk level of the project and some other relevant information. And when preparing the on the spot check, uh, mm, Considering also some other uh, information about the project, like uh, contract conditions and uh, uh, some other reports from from all sites, uh, previous uh, findings, and so on and so forth, so from Arachne to plan how how many times to visit a certain certain sites. Let's say. Also, we use it for the monitoring of the overall and the float risk and take into account. Uh, especially the indicator propensity for the bankruptcy of the contractor because we consider it as, um, as a hint of the pressure element of the crop triangle and uh, this is uh, yeah, an indicator, a red flag for us to, to put some more attention when, when considering the payment claims of this contractor. So this is the use of the IP tool for the moment. Uh, about the SCADA system, the main objective is to ensure continued reliable operation and recurring of the gelatin system that we spoke about. It is based on Ethernet communication and also fiber connection to some remote, remote devices. Uh, it has a number of uh, subsystems, uh, electrical system, ventilation system, lighting, emergency tunnel monitoring system, which is about the construction. So these are the screens about ventilation, it, it looks uh, something like that. I'm 
going a bit uh, faster to the slide because I think that uh, the time is uh, uh, I'm closer to the, to the end of the presentation. But if you have questions later on, I can and we'll be happy to answer. So these are the subscreens uh, for ventilation uh, when where uh, by uh, utilizing remote controls, one can uh, see what is the situation in the tunnel. This is about the subscreen of the lightning about the fire alarm and uh, using this uh, remote controls and especially the system for the monitoring of the structure integrity of the tunnel this might be important in cases of uh, claims and uh, some occurrences during the use of the, the facility uh, that uh, might turn out to be related to some uh, irregularities during the construction let's say so uh, that's why it is good that uh, we have this system and uh, which kind of systems it uh, uh, might be of okay help also on another, let's say, another types of uh, facilities like bridges and so on. So we also have a traffic monitoring system uh, in Bulgaria. Uh, this is uh, this is actually a map of the traffic. In the red, uh, you see the the traffic which is above seven thousand. Uh, Units. Uh, this is the, about the road traffic. Uh, Seven thousand units per uh, per day, up to thirty thousand. And the different the different uh, colors uh, are related to the different level of uh, traffic. Uh, so this is a map of of the stations where are situated the stations of this system. We also have uh, open data. All, all this data, which is captured by the stations, uh, is uh, available on our portal for open data. And uh, it can be analyzed by all interested parties. Uh, it is available in CSV format and also some, some, other, uh, some other formats. Uh, about the system shortly, uh, it is operational from 2013, currently with around 300 cameras, uh, originally designed for monitoring and analysis of the traffic. Uh, it can capture the registration number, class and length of the uh, vehicle. It also can measure the, um, the weight of the vehicle. So uh, it is proposed to use this camera also to, for measuring the average speed uh, and to, to use it uh, for some penalties because it is not the case at the moment, but we shall see because it is not still part of the law. And we also have a toll system in Bulgaria, which is operational from three years now or something like that. Uh, you see in this purple, uh, this purple color, uh, the, the first class road and in the blue, the second, the, oh, another class of road, which, uh, which are also, uh, Sorry, the, 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 in, the, in the purple are the motorways and the, in the blue are first class roads, which are subject to tow. So only part of the, of, of the roads uh, in, road in Bulgaria are subject to tow. And uh, here is uh, my, my final slide. Uh, here, here is another uh, link to uh, another link to drone images uh, for the western arc of the Sofia Ring Road, which is only which is also uh, constructed uh, co-funded by European Union and uh, we see here that the data which came from the traffic cameras allowed us to to know that about 70,000 vehicles are using daily this uh, specific section and where exactly they come from and uh, this data combined can be used to, to verify the indicators for the uh, road projects because when you when you uh, declare that certain traffic will be present at the date x uh, this can be verified and uh, be uh, demonstrated to the auditing uh, organizations so thank you very much for your attention and uh, of course i remain for questions. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marco, for uh, the, our unique opportunity to get a glimpse of how technology is used uh, uh, to view the transport and other systems in Bulgaria. And we'll uh, come back to you uh, during the question and answer session. Thank you. Now we will thank the representative, Mr. Markov, how the technologies are used at, uh, in public sector. And we will continue with an exciting story from the Latvian perspective about the information system of the EU fund projects, uh, which is an e-tool. And also, if you have any questions about the next presentation, you're welcome to send them in the chat. And it's my pleasure to welcome the deputy head of the Central Finance and Contracting Agency, Mr. Martin Jubrensis. So, good afternoon all. I will start, I will begin my presentation. As Artis mentioned, the content will be related to IT system. Maybe it's not so impressive when we spoke about the satellites or drones, but we do believe IT systems and integrated IT systems are quite effective tools. Uh, for remote situations, also especially in the current circumstances. So I've chosen the topic. Yeah, Tā, man viņš, uh, uh, jā, ir. Uh, nu, lūk, un, uh, ja mēs runājam par sistēmu, tad... Um, If we speak about the system, uh, already for a while, we've been developing this platform uh, for our internal work and also for the financial recipients. That's our interactive tool, integrated tool. So projects can be led uh, remotely. It means there are several functions for the system. It's exchange of information, data service, uh, exchange of information where we can communicate and it keeps developing. When we speak about significant things like security, we have received a ISO certificate confirming the system is safe and reflects all the necessary security measures. We also developed the system uh, different uh, logical tests, uh, then the compiling systems. It means uh, we have some data available, we gather data from other systems, and these data are accessible to our clients. If we speak in numbers, we can see the contracts uh, concluded, we can see the projects entered, the amendments made, as well as the payment requests. Uh, of course, our clients are interested, the most important for them is to receive the funding in a timely manner. Uh, we receive the requests, we check the information and we make the payment. The basic information are these payment requests, plus additional information and the relevant documentation is, are the things which we uh, work with. As I mentioned initially, I think uh, one of the key things of the system and advantages of the system is data exchange uh, integration. It's a long way. We have gone through. Uh, a number of organizations have been mentioned. We have agreed to exchange data. We can mention th that this has been a long process information was possessed by the organizations and the thing we have done is we have eased quite significantly um, the process. So basically the information we need to gather, these are 42 different uh, data fields uh, to provide information to the client. And, and basically the majority of the information we have gathered for those in informations, we do not ask anymore. 
uh, there is some object information which we do not know, we do not possess, and the state in institutions don't have them as well. Uh, yes, so there is still some free um, slot, but still significant part of information is available, and we do not request separately, uh, we can gather it uh, ourselves. On the improvements, I think these are the most important ones we have implemented, so-called message board, a kind of reminder. Uh, this is information in a clear window accessible to the user, both eyes for the, uh, on the project, on the implementation, on the timeline, what and what needs to be done in the nearest future. The same system or similar system is for our employees, uh, no need for Excel or Word files. Uh, this is on the verification of payment requests. This is a long process. We can digitalize the things which are in order uh, practically and also physically. So this verification of payment requests is our internal process and, and there's procedure how we verify those what kind of information should be included in these requests. And uh, so we have to uh, include it in the system, not to do it in parallelly by hand and then to upload to the system. On the procurement plan, uh, this is again available, what kind of information has to be submitted we have improved not only the procurement plans and then uh, integrated them within the existing systems, but already in the existing projects and cases, we have developed the system as following. We do not ask this information to the client, but we can see and gather this information from other resources. On the user experience, I think it's worth a separate presentation, but, but we have time limit. Uh, we use this user experience or UX means that we have contracted team, external contracted team, which works with our internal and external users and every new activities or new functionalities, implementation of these uh, come into practice at the moment when we are completely sure from A to Z that this is the best, the best solution, the most friendliest, the friendliest solution for, you, for the user. And uh, I must say we have saved the time, uh, it has been evaluated uh, and we have found uh, a better solution. And it's a really good practice example. And of course, this story which I'm trying to sell today, we would still have to mention the circumstances caused by COVID-19. Uh, the agency was one of the uh, rare state services who could ensure their work completely remotely. Uh, there were several prerequisitions as the system is accessible for, for our employees as well as the clients. And it means that EU phone, EU fund monitoring hasn't stopped at any point. No one had to look, search for project lead. Where is he located, he or she located? Uh, we could do everything. We could insert the information into the system, the documents, the data. And as you can see from the information, the only feature which hasn't been implemented if we compare this year and, and, and the previous year, these are the extraordinary uh, checks, extraordinary tests. Uh, when we arrive and, and check our clients, basically the ones that have planned everyone, everything has been done. 
but this hasn't affected nor our work nor our clients work and I think uh, it's especially uh, very important during pandemic to access the finance in a timely manner. Now we can see also the um, statistics and comparison on, on uh, comparison of detected uh, uh, non-compliance. We cannot say that COVID has somehow specially affected or relates to our work. Of course, uh, project cycle is a fact. Uh, they approach their end. Uh, uh, building services, uh, there are some exceptions in terms of timeline, longer timeline, maybe additional documentation is needed. But the fact that system provides data from other databases we also get also the information from the building sector. So concerning this segment, we gather the information from the control center, construction control center. Yeah, so we can really check all the documentation uh, on spot. And financially, we can say that there is increase um, increase uh, in terms of fraud cases. Uh, we have six um, cases with quite significant amounts uh, in order to stop these cases. But in terms of uh, cases, we cannot say that there has been a significant change I'm not sure if it's the effectiveness of our work or uh, evaluation of our work, but I think uh, digital cooperation with the client helps a lot. There's less stress in terms of uh, uh, custom service. Um, both sides have the information about the project implementation. There is no need uh, going physically from point A to point B to get into the office one or another. And with this respect, uh, while participating in different conferences on, on remote working, e-services, I think for institutions, this is of crucial importance uh, to make their sector available digitally to make their uh, services uh, e accessible i think that is really the key to success uh, if you started in a timely manner we know other institutions with whom which has started the digitalization already earlier and now it's really a success that's all from my side at this stage Thank you for your presentation. I'm sure we will meet again in our Q&A section. Once again, thank you to Mr. Martin Brands, Deputy Head of the CSEA. Our next presentation will be shortly. Remember, you can uh, send in your questions as well. Next presentation is on artificial intelligence. Um, all the uh, buzzwords buzzwords that we uh, hear all the time artificial intelligence is what we hear all the time but how does it go in the context of fraud and our presenter is data scientist Baines Nudiens. Hello, hello everyone thank you for the opportunity and uh, meanwhile i'll try to share my screen I'll give you a general oversight about the opportunities 
and um, challenges of artificial intelligence in connection to uh, fraud and fight against fraud. I'll start with the most important question. What is artificial intelligence or AI? Uh, there are several myths um, about what is AI. AI. Uh, one of the most popular is uh, that is some kind of robot war workforce that will um, take away um, work from humans. But um, actually, the truth is that um, um, it is already happening, and it will happen that human workforce is rotating, meaning that when we actually need the human brain uh, for its creativity or for any uh, crisis situations, then we will continue using human brain and the um, possibilities of our uh, brain. But all the uh, monotone repeating uh, work can be given over to robots. Therefore, I don't see it as a big uh, scare. Next myth is that artificial intelligence is smarter than a human, but um, that is also uh, false, um, as uh, humans have a general intelligence, while um, AIs um, are taught or fed um, information. Uh, they learn uh, to do certain uh, functions, for example, to uh, recommend movies uh, on Netflix. So can we say that a Netflix recommendation system is smarter than a human? Um, I don't think so, but it does its function. It, um, it solves one uh, problem. And uh, probably it does it better than a human would, but uh, that's um, uh, just a detail. Um, another um, myth is black box. Uh, that we don't really understand, we uh, put in some, uh, something and we get uh, a result. We don't know what happens in between, but um, actually um, artificial intelligence um, helps with transparency and to, uh, for us to understand how um, artificial uh, neural networks are working to see how the process happens step by step, especially if we use um, a certain solution in situations of crisis. For example, self-driving cars, where um, AI is used, uh, where any um, mistake uh, can be lethal for a human, Therefore, um, every step of the artificial intelligence in this sense is being researched. Um, also, I want to mention the definition of artificial intelligence, that is the uh, ability of system to um, interpret data uh, from all the experience that it has learned to gain certain goals. Uh, when we're talking about um, fight against fraud, then I want to tell, show you the chain, how it is happening. Um, it can, uh, usually the fraud is detected based on certain rules or um, screening. Uh, the fraudster does a certain fraudulent action. Uh, and there are certain rules that are used for screening. If fraud is uh, detected, then the in this case is given further uh, to the certain institution. Uh, these rules have to be uh, detected. Uh, these rules have to be defined first. Um, and often it doesn't go along with the time. Uh, these definitions are uh, static. So if there's a new type of produce, it's not going to be detected. Another big um, mechanism 
how to do it, how to detect fraud, is to have um, random screening. And that is usual uh, random manual check when uh, um, actual human checks uh, if that's a fraudulent action or no. But how would this process look with the help of um, artificial intelligence? Uh, users, all actions are saved in database and uh, saved in history. If we um, add other databases and have additional information about the user, uh, particularly in detection fraud, as AI can um, detect um, actions that maybe um, humans can't due to the big uh, vast amount of uh, data, then um, AI model would um, detect certain um, actions that the user does. So IA model is being trained to understand every action of the user and to detect if that is a fraudulent action or no. If um, IA model does detect a fraudulent action, it's a red uh, flag, and then the human uh, gets involved and uh, rechecks the uh, particular case. Also, the IA models can improve with time as they receive more and more uh, historical data. So they can learn from new practices that haven't happened before. So what are the opportunities of artificial intelligence? As I mentioned before, um, artificial intelligence can process big data and to uh, understand what is behind the big data. Also, um, we get an additional value, um, increased precision. At the same time, um, all the actions are being processed, not just um, separate actions. Also, the system can adapt with time, uh, depending on the um, AI model. And I mean that um, more the data it gets, um, it learns more and adapts, or it adapts with time, based on the actions of users. Another um, opportunity is scaling, that we can add new uh, data sources, new types of data, or we can um, broaden the goal. And also uh, we can decrease costs as um, humans have to do less work, uh, le they have to check less. Uh, they do their checks only um, based on what the um, artificial intelligence model um, produces. And what are the challenges? The first thing is data accessibility and quality. For example, Facebook and Google uh, collect a very vast amounts of uh, data about their users and use it for their businesses um, and they are not um, sharing the information or data. Um, and often um, businesses or organizations buy data to have uh, bigger databases. And that's how they are improving, improving the AI uh, model. Uh, we have a saying that data is the new gold. So I think um, uh, I have to stress here that um, AI models 
don't work with little amounts of data. We need big, vast amounts of data, big data. Also, data has to be um, with high quality. So we have to have data engineers um, who are preparing and saving the data uh, to create this AI model. Um, also, a uh, model can't function if it has um, low quality data, meaning just directly collected data, uh, big data. And finally, also development and maintenance. We need specialists uh, to um, develop these tools and to maintain these tools. And uh, specialists have to become experts. They have to understand uh, what data they are working with. And of course, we need IT infrastructure where the data is actually saved and also where the IA model is saved. But as the uh, cloud service is growing, I don't see a big problem regarding this. That uh, shortly it from my side. That was a very general overview of uh, how the artificial intelligence works. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nudens, for the presentation. I think we uh, got more clarity on the artificial intelligence and we can continue it during our discussion uh, how to apply it so i'd like to thank rain students for the presentation we will meet him also later during our question answer session we have another presentation about the digital immunity between people and tools so member of the board of Datacom, Mr. Janis Čupriks, will present the topic. Welcome, Janis. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yes, thank you also to the previous speaker. Thank you for the invitation, allowing to participate in the conference. Maybe a short comment on the previous presentation. I think this was an excellent example how the satellite images provided by Indulis uh, could be realized in practice, how we deal with big data. I think I'm, I'm always very happy when I see something that difficult things can be done in a simple way. So thank you to the previous presenter. Uh, it was a very successful illustration and today I would like to speak about the immunity and about hygiene. Uh, themes very topical for all of us, although we hear this more in line about face masks, disinfectants and other things no? which are very topical in relation to immunity but also IT immunity is a very important question and that's the thing I would like to present today. Why is it a problem, a challenge and why is it topical? In order to implement processes in organ organizations to achieve the objectives, to do our work we need people, we need processes, we need uh, technological tools, how we can implement the processes in an automatic way, remote way, and in digital form. The further we go, uh, we become more digitalized, we transform, uh, we need new, new hygiene requirements using technologies. But uh, why doesn't it work? At Datacom, we try to provide explanations 
how to solve certain questions, how to look at things to make them simpler. And the most popular is that everything that is related to digital hygiene, that's something uh, request to the IT specialists, but at the same time, he's also responsible for the users to feel comfortable, to have appropriate IT tools, uh, not to complain, everything should work. And uh, these things do not go alongside. So, uh, uh, the, last, the least our users are going alongside these hygiene rules, uh, probably they uh, also will not follow the rules the IT person is trying to implement in the organization. So what are the questions? Um, we hear how organizations look at IT security questions. If we look at leadership, we are not uh, so much um, of interest for anyone to approach us. That's one of the things. There is also like a bit of understanding of security breach. And uh, for a large company, that's not only about um, drawbacks for the company itself, but also for his cooperation partners. Uh, uh, looking for a response, what are you protecting by your IT infrastructure? You have to ask the IT specialist, as he or she knows best. Uh, but this is the question also to the lead, head of the organization, whether IT specialist is the one who is responsible for IT tools we are using on a daily basis, and whether we as a management use know how these digital instruments accessible at one or another point impact our work. Another question is about learning, uh, education, uh, educating employees about IT hygiene. I have to say that the situation is improving and this is the thing we have to discuss. We have to ensure that employees know the security measures, but still in some organization, it's a kind of compulsory formality and quite often there is a lack of this practical background uh, and really to get this feedback how much the employee has understood and, and uh, will he or she act differently in the future. Quite often the leads, the management says that uh, once a year we have the uh, fire alarm test and the uh, resources are devoted to this and people have to leave the rooms and, and test all the system, how they come back into the office. But at the same time, when we ask how often do you check uh, your reserve copies and try to recover your systems, then there is a misunderstanding whether it's really needed. So there is a lack of understanding that this is important uh, stage to ensure uh, the business itself, whether it's possible to protect everything and to ensure that everything is secure for 100%, I can say for sure no, and it will never be, but we always have to find the balance, the right balance. It has, we have to look at it as a, a daily practice, and then our immunity will be sufficient if the process will be understood as a continuous process, ongoing process. We educate the user, we test the knowledge, we improve, the things that needs to be improved and we start again. What happens in the world and what are the most popular things that um, violators try to get uh, data from our users, from our companies and the most popular thing is still 
so-called fishing, so-called fishing. As we can see from the analytics, this will not come to an end, it will continue to develop. And it's another example, we have to continue uh, to educate our employees to know uh, how to use technologies in a correct way and uh, how not to get caught on, on this uh, phishing. Why is it possible as such? So first of all, there are wide, there is wide knowledge nowadays. So basically, uh, the person who would like to get the data from your company, he has looked uh, who are your cooperation partners. So it's targeted attack. He has learned some marketing things. Uh, he, he can format uh, to impact you psychologically. You understand, some, you, you get some interesting email. It's nicely created. Um, it, it's in a way you have to click something, you have to do something. And these things, what hackers are doing on our systems, they keep developing every year and every year we have to inform our users about these developments. What uh, we have to be able to distinguish, to see, The next important aspect is related how to evaluate the risks, uh, the ones to minimize with some tools and how to reach this balance. Most likely it's not possible to protect everything, otherwise the costs will exceed the amounts which at least we theoretically can devote to the protection. But as I say, attacks uh, develop, also hackers learn. They understand more and more how to impact our employees uh, in order to get valuable information. But there are also simple things which uh, we still can see that entrepreneurs uh, do not pay enough attention. There is this phenomenon that in Latvia and in the world we use the same tools like Windows system, Microsoft Office package, other very popular uh, tools. But what we can say, these tools are not protected, they are not renewed with these security networks, but the hackers who try to get into our systems, so they try to crack these popular tools because they can cover uh, and get into a wider uh, target group. So these simple hygiene requirements and maximal automatic approach internally uh, is of added value. We have to avoid the manual approach nowadays as we have enough automatic opportunities about uh, clouds. Uh, we've been speaking for several years. It's our it's on our daily agenda nowadays. It has been developed. It has developed uh, faster than we thought. And there are also different understandings in the organizations. To maintain the cloud, they take care of our systems, of the power of our system. But in many cases, especially the enterprise who locates their systems on the cloud, have to take care how the users approach the cloud how we save our data there, how we can recover the data, and how can ensure uh, that uh, no one else can approach it. There's also another point in relation to these reserve copies. 
it's important we do need them but in terms of uh, cloud services sometimes there's a wrong understanding if it's uh, on the, in the cloud it's safe whether do i really need this copy yes we do need this copy as a copy it's not for the sake of copying it's important to maintain these uh, simple standardization processes where we check these uh, copies uh, once a year, once in a half year, whether this copy can be recovered and whether we can recover our data and continue our work. Also, these reserve copies and usage uh, have become quite popular. It's linked uh, to this kind of animal uh, and statements uh, in press that large company has lost uh, its data, has somebody has cracked the system and uh, penalty, not apologies, not the penalty, but a lot of money has been, uh, has to be invested in order to get the system back and to ensure that data uh, have been kept. So the reserve copy is one of the real instruments that are being used. Uh, not to pay to the uh, violators, but uh, really to continue our work. So what to do? There are many risks. Users, we are all different education levels. If we look at potential security solutions, there are so many that we can really get lost in a very nice presentations. We have our own present approach, how we try to help entrepreneurs. And that's the practice, how difficult things to make simple, whether we do it ourselves or we can have external contractor, but we have to understand what is accessible from data, where are they located, and what's the impact on business process. We identify risks, uh, which processes will be stopped, interrupted, or what kind of data uh, will be lost. When we know the risks, uh, we can evaluate the priorities, uh, the things we have to solve now, and the things we can leave for a later stage. What else is important? We have to understand the risks at all levels. We choose also the responsible uh, people in the organization for the best practice in terms of usage of IT instruments. And as soon as we introduce some novelties, we start educating the users. We test how much they have understood. We evaluate. We see if there are any uh, lacking points and we start the circle again. And what I want to say again, the circle never ends. The hygiene requirements in IT systems never, never will disappear. We have to do it. We have to do smarter every year by year. We have to also uh, look back into the history and we may identify what we have to deal with in the future. That concludes my presentation today. Thank you for your overview about the digital hygiene, which is important in also broader and not only the talking about fraud, I would like to in, invite every speaker of this uh, section to turn on their uh, cameras um, to um, start our Q&A section. So let's get to our questions. Uh, Chuprik, Mr. Chuprik, I would like to um, direct this uh, question to you. 
Jūs ir beigās vai tehnoloģiju pielietojums mūsdienās? Jūs Art prāk... technology, helping to combat fraud or more technologies are developing, bigger opportunities are also to the criminals. I think the technologies help. The process cannot be stopped. It keeps on developing. It is developing on both sides. And we have to keep on uh, developing and learn from our mistakes. We can't turn back anymore. We just have to find the way how to use the technology in the right way to help each other. Um, if you want to comment, please raise your hands. Uh, Mr. Abalinch, please. Yes, uh, about technologies and how to work with data. I would like to um, agree with the comment that I heard before that data is uh, um, modern gold. And that can be applied also to the institutions um, and uh, that we are seeing more and more remote um, audits that uh, one uh, individual can look at thousand cases and can find something. Um, it, um, audit, auditing meant that, for example, uh, before we visited 10 um, farms, but now we are working with databases, we can find much more information there rather than using random um, screening uh, where we are going somewhere um, on random. Maybe we'll continue with you, Mr. Arbolinch. Um, we heard about artificial intelligence, we talked about um, crowd immunity, uh, but you showed in your presentation um, how much the um, agriculture uh, rural support service is doing um, remotely. How much are you using artificial intelligence? Um, similarly to other colleagues, we are working exclusively electronically. Uh, one thing that uh, all this system is doing, maybe it's not especially artificial intelligence, but where we're doing cross-referencing. Um, um, currently, this cross-referencing is done in 60-70% that only system is uh, checking if the data that agriculture is providing is correct. Uh, here I can't say that, that artificial intelligence, but we have a system in place that is checking if the um, applicants um, are showing the correct um, information. Uh, this uh, current year, uh, we have a new pilot project where we are implementing um, a control mechanism using exclusively these um, satellite images where only the six in Europe who are uh, doing it. Um, it is not such an easy project, uh, maybe that's why it's not so um, popular. Uh, but uh, we are very broadly using satellites uh, and we can look back in the history what has happened. Also, uh, Mr. Brent, this your presentation gave us like a new overview um, that uh, there are different data that can be used in new ways. Um, I, rem I remember that you were saying that um, you can, you have some kind of data already existing that you don't always have to ask for data to be delivered or reported. 
at the very beginning of our conference, Mr. Dalders um, mentioned that there has been about 31.7 million um, euro, euros in fraud. What about your system? Uh, you were mentioning 17 and 5 cases of fraud. How the system that you have in place helps to um, detect the um, cases of fraud? Maybe give us some examples. Uh, was it the system that noticed the uh, uh, fraud? I would say the system helps us to collect data and to see tendencies. As Janis Tupriks already mentioned, also artificial intelligence is created by humans. Um, But in IT systems, of course, we have some primary data and secondary data. Um, if we're talking about secondary data that is used again and again, then um, we are saving on manual work. Talking about tendencies um, regarding projects and financing, we see certain features that maybe helps us to come to certain conclusions. But oh, we are still on the way to have a complete big data analysis system. Our project that I was pre presenting today, we still have two other IT products um, in development. So everything that we have right now uh, we can uh, use it even more in the future. The good news is, yes, uh, we can ask for less information from our uh, clients, but on the other hand, um, if we have more data, and if we keep on growing this data, we need somebody who is also maintaining this uh, data, and it is not getting easier. Availability of big data means also different uh, type of analysis. And that is a challenge for the future. We are doing currently what we can in separate cases. Uh, the separate cases are not giving us an overview and to give us uh, understanding if it's a standard situation. Uh, these six cases where we had susp uh, suspicion about fraud, we can't give a general um, overview. If we would have a list of uh, fraudsters or baddies, then it would be easier for us to live and to do our work. Uh, but we don't have any analysis currently. Um, But the um, fraud of uh, fraud of procurement, of course, are um, repeating. We hope that our clients will um, learn from their mistakes and understand why what they are doing is wrong. But of course, more data we have, more analysis we have, uh, more uh, productive we are. But that is a big challenge for the future. And not only regarding the IT section as such, but also regarding fraud, because also the criminals are getting smarter and smarter and they are receiving more and more data. We will definitely come back to the challenges, but I would like to ask Markov uh, to maybe give some um, examples of fraud. Uh, we saw already some um, examples of how you're monitoring the process of the project, but we are mostly talking about detecting fraud, about red flags. Maybe you can give some examples from your experience where technologies have helped you to detect um, and uh, 
uh, any red uh, flags or post factum to um, catch uh, fraud cases. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the interesting question. Well, uh, actually, uh, we don't have a case of fraud in our operational program, to be honest, which is both good and bad because uh, we, we can never be sure that uh, it is 100% free of fraud, but uh, this is the case for the moment. We are dealing uh, mainly with irregularities uh, related to public procurement. And uh, we have uh, ex post uh, uh, ex post checks. Uh, we have such departments uh, as a managing authority. And uh, the, what I would like to share with you perhaps is uh, that uh, uh, transport projects, uh, as you know, are the largest in terms of uh, amounts involved, let's say. And also, this means that the irregularities involved are also very large. And uh, in fact, we have one case of irregularity out of 60 for this programming period, which is responsible for 52% of, of the entire budget. Uh, so, uh, let's say the lesson learned for us was that we should uh, think beforehand uh, about the, the size of the contracts that, uh, that should be designed uh, in order to implement our projects. And uh, this uh, actually can be derived uh, following an analysis, statistical analysis of the available data. Uh, so this is kind of, kind of uh, a tool. But because we, uh, we have a uh, very small number of uh, projects and uh, contracts compared to some other sectors, I would not dare to call this uh, artificial intelligence or data analytics uh, because uh, there are involved uh, much more, uh, let's say, uh, much larger volumes of data and variety of data, but still the statistical analysis of the available data allows us to, to understand which types of irregularities are most common and uh, which type of irregularities uh, need our attention. Because if we have some types of irregularities more, more common, this might mean that there is some uh, ill intention involved, let's say. So uh, analyzing our types of irregularities, we have uh, a lot of irregularities uh, related to um, tender criteria, which are uh, too strict, uh, too narrow, let's say, that can um, prevent the wider uh, competition. So this also came as a result of an analysis, but uh, using very basic tool like Excel sheet. But I would say that the important thing is the analysis and the top that you put in, in your work rather than the specific tool. So this is from my side. And also uh, before ending, I, I would just like to let you know that uh, we, we thought that it might be beneficial to have a common uh, guidance uh, on the risks involved in the transport infrastructure project by the European Commission and specifically by popular working groups. And that's why we initiated uh, such working group. Uh, we sent a letter, let's say, to all of us about that. And uh, we hope some such initiative to be, uh, to kick off such initiative. And uh, we will be happy to work together on this. So thank you. Paldies, paldies, Marko. Kungs arī par ieskatu tehnoloģiju pielietājumā. Uh, thank you, Mr. Marko, for your insight. Uh, Mr. Nudians, um, we heard three different stories how technologies are used, um, artificial intelligence, um, different platforms, um, or the same um, Excel files. You mentioned the problem, the different systems um, if we're talking about detecting um, fraud, uh, are living along with us, uh, developing in time. Uh, that we can't often um, detect the newest cases.
but how can we um, change this problem? How can we find a solution to this problem? It's again an uh, issue of cooperation, cooperation between systems, between yeah, states. If you're talking about solutions that are not using artificial intelligence, then time to time we should check the rules um, that are set for the red um, flags that um, detect. Um, here is the um, human factor crucial that somebody has to go through the information, analyze it, and understand what are the current trends. If we're looking at the uh, AI solutions, then one of the solutions is um, to use the current historic data and to predict is it fraud or not. Another model is uh, looking for anomaly or actions that are not typical and, and, in, and further giving these cases to a human to um, overview. Maybe you can continue artificial intelligence model. Uh, give us some practical examples where such models can be used. Uh, Mr. Abolinch, for example, gave us uh, examples of pictures that are analyzed, images. Maybe you can give us some um, examples of um, artificial intelligence models. What are the other practical sides where we could use this model with the right tools? Practically, I see several options. For example, in procurement or certain projects. Uh, we stress on the previous um, historical prices that we've had in previous projects. Uh, that could be as a, a feature that maybe human can't notice or detect that artificial uh, intelligence system could detect. Um, then relations um, to detect um, in a conflict of interest. A human should go through um, all the information, what, are the, what is the relationship between different people, but um, AI model can quickly find any relations. Uh, maybe Mr. Brent can uh, give us a comment uh, regarding the prices, um, not only within your system, but also wider, um, how realistic it is to compare the prices, because um, it sounds very well theoretically, um, how, when we look how much something cost some time ago and then what it costs right now. Is it practical? It's not only practical, but it is happening. Um, that's how we are using our database uh, to understand uh, the price of a unit where we don't need the um, additional uh, process but to, where we have to understand what is the price of um, a unit and that's where we need such uh, data. We need a very uh, con uh, concrete data about certain uh, time. So we understand that a certain service costs certain price um, during these two years. For example, certain training costs a certain um, amount of money and that's what we are going to pay. Uh, that can be related also to other services, for example, building. Uh, ministry has used uh, this uh, calculation in certain cases, but we hope also in the future to continue to use such um, data. 
we do know that um, this type of analysis involves uh, lots of um, resources. It is a different time of analysis, but it is a direction that we are using and we are um, encouraging ministries to use this um, type of analysis tool. As we understand, data is not something static. You're not you putting it in a shelf and uh, keeping it there and storing it there, but it is active. Um, where we are using it. And by analyzing the data, we understand how much, what costs, um, and we don't need any unnecessary pro, uh, procedures. It is already happening now. Uh, we can hear different examples. Maybe Mr. Abul and first, then Mr. Chuprik how much the state um, is uh, ready for such innovative um, tools. What are the challenges that um, we would, uh, that state would adapt these technical tools? There are many challenges. Um, of course, our employers are um, with um, by initiatives, um, but at the same time, we have also limits. Um, there are also uh, basic cases where we, um, as I mentioned before about the um, examples that I mentioned that there are things that are nothing is done but then there are more complicated cases as well. Currently we have a um, case um, where we are um, having a discussion what kind of um, plant it is. But uh, now when we are in, in the court that um, with a certain case, then uh, it is interesting to see what the result is going to be. But at the same time, I think it is um, our current lives that we are monitoring everything. We have uh, a lot of data we are following. Um, everything we're following um, how much we walk what is our heart rate how much our children use um, internet and that is a part of our life the new technologies uh, part of it um, is um, telephone our phone our mobile phone um, our internet um, banking and um, sometimes I'm um, surprised that uh, the system is actually working so uh, precisely. Um, it is undeniably our future and our life right now. Uh, Mr. Chupriks, I'm sure it is difficult for you to give an overview about the all state in institutions, but still, uh, I'm sure you are cooperating with the, the IT specialists from the state institutions. Um, how advanced is um, state regarding um, technologies? Who is uh, more progressed, um, state institutions or private sector? I think we shouldn't talk about it as a um, competition. Uh, state is not a business and business is not state. Secondly, I think uh, in Latvia, many state institutions have very uh, good IT tools and um, good potential in future. The tools that are used already today to communicate with our state institutions are wide and um, various and we are using them. 
my observation um, of um, a future step for the state institution is that we have many good projects. It's written, it's um, developed, and implemented, but in the future, the project is nothing special. Uh, no project is work, living or existing on its own. But we have to understand that the development of the project in the once it's ready is the moment when it actually works. Um, what are the people who are going to work with it, who are going to develop it further? For example, to add artificial intelligence or add some data, as we have a lot of uh, data, we can use it very vastly. And I think that is the challenge. How, from the moment when we created the product, when we implemented it in life, to have people developing it further. Of course, there are issues of uh, financing, the team, and so on. If you're talking about security, we can um, check what is the security at the moment when it is implemented, but we have to keep on checking what the security is, because in a few weeks the situation is already different. That is the main challenge how to, to create the teams that are maintaining the systems. And I'm not talking only about this technical administration and technical maintenance, rather collecting ideas and um, supplementing the um, project. Mr. Uh, Brent, uh, yes, we are not in competition. For example, when we need data from um, other institutions and they are not structured, um, that is very big work to structure uh, the data that exists. For example, when we go to a different institution and ask for data, then we are looking what is the result going to be. So for us, it is important that all the institutions are open to share data and also um, have united server or united system how we can share the data. As long as I remember, we have talked about this topic and I wish there would be a progress in this uh, issue. But open data um, is um, a solution. If there's anybody, anybody from a, another institution, that would be really great that we could uh, exchange information rather than creating each our own uh, web servers and databases. So now I'm looking at the questions we have received and uh, partially Mr. Abalinch already answered it, but make it, maybe we can provide the answer publicly also. So question was related to the exchange of uh, knowledge within the EU. So basically something that can be used in France, something can be, be used in Slovenia, something in Latvia as uh, these uh, cultures are, are similar, crop cultures. As I have responded in writing, so there are joint projects at EU level and there are studies. Uh, to one of these projects is sent for CUP, a well-known project. There is also cooperation between the countries, also using this COVID situation and, and opportunity to work in Zoom. We have had virtual visits to Spanish agency and Belgian agency um, to get to know how they do all these things. 
but I also must say that in many countries and internally in the country the situation is differently because spring starts earlier in Kurzeme than in other parts of Latvia. And the same goes, the first uh, summer frosts are from Vidzeme and then it comes to other parts of Latvia. So there are specific circumstances uh, and the algorithms have to be adopted and we simply cannot copy paste them from another country. Also the products uh, which have been developed, they have to be improved, we have to adapt to our situation uh, and it's also related to weather um, and other aspects. Mr. Marco, uh, perhaps we can ask your view, how to use technologies between the countries, whether we can uh, take good examples from other countries, whether you have such kind of cooperation with other countries, uh, data sharing, uh, which helps to solve some questions easier. Thank you, thank you very much for this question. Actually, I was uh, planning myself to, <laughs> to intervene with compliments on this, so uh, thank you. On this? Uh, so the exchange of data, I think, is uh, very relevant also to the transport sector because uh, we are talking about 20 corridors uh, which, uh, which uh, uh, link our countries uh, and uh, the road, uh, more or less, is road, uh, be it in Latvia or Lithuania or in Bulgaria or in UK, whatever. whatever. Uh, of course, there are uh, certain, uh, certain variations in the specifications uh, but uh, still there is uh, quite a room for exchange of data. For example, because when we are talking about big data, uh, one of the challenges is to get enough uh, data to analyze. Uh, th there can be uh, some data related to, to the physical implementation of the, uh, on, on, the, on site. Uh, if we capture, let's say, by drones uh, in a number of countries, uh, we can then uh, have uh, more information about uh, the implementation of certain technology or, or whatever. We also already have open data, uh, EO open data por uh, portal about the tender data, which is a good step, but I think it can be, uh, it can be uh, further enriched. And uh, actually, I wrote uh, an article on this in uh, 2019 about uh, fraud risks and not only fraud risks and about the uh, use of big data for transport infrastructure and I will be very happy to send you the link later on uh, to, to, to share it with your audience and of course we'll be very happy for any feedback. And finally about this issue, I think that uh, we can uh, use some other tools uh, available uh, at EU level like Horizon Europe program, research program uh, for uh, for some topics uh, related uh, to the exchange of data, specifically for transport infrastructure, let's, uh, let's say, for example. And uh, a couple of years ago, uh, actually, Bulgaria proposed such topic to be included to in Horizon 2020. Uh, it didn't happen because, you know, it's a very competitive process. But uh, I will be happy to exchange uh, thoughts with uh, any interested parties from Latvia on this, and perhaps uh, this conference can be a good kickstart of uh, cooperation in that regard. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Markov, uh, for the answer. Uh, turning to Latvia and past that is Latvia, Shuvalo, that Shua, Yauta, and Shuadio. So, thank you. Now uh, we will conclude our Q and A session as our first day is approaching to its end. Now I would like to thank all the presenters or the participants of the panel. So first of all, Indul Sabolinj, uh, Mr. Jan Jasen Marko, Mr. Martin Brenzis, uh, Mr. Reynis Nudiens, and Mr. Janis Čupriks. So thank you for your participation, thank you for your responses, valuable information. I think a diverse day has passed in our digital conference. During the first panel we spoke about uh, the significance of the topic and I think one of the points I can recall 
speaking about these umbrella tasks or main tasks that have to be done, I think there were several good points about timely involvement of different parties, uh, also this societal mood, also IT usage was used, uh, that came across also during the third panel. It's a kind of um, tool, how we can determine fraud cases. Uh, in the second part, we spoke about these red flags, red signals, uh, fraud risks. This is very practical uh, that AFCOS is dealing with this typology in Latvia. This can help also for others. Uh, when we speak about procurement cases and the topic uh, which went all through the discussion between the organizations and specialists. So uh, basically this cooperation between different institutions and levels really can help to determine at early stages these red flags and today we concluded uh, on the technologies um, as a tools um, also to detect and prevent uh, there's quite a spectrum uh, there are good examples uh, in public sector how we use technologies uh, we had also bulgarian experience on uh, it usage and how really diverse opportunities are there we heard also about challenges, what competences are needed to use IT um, wisely and also to, do, to be able to determine the fraud situations. Uh, I would like to remind that tomorrow uh, we start our second day of the conference at 9 o'clock Latvian time. And tomorrow we will look more in detail into the interest uh, conflict of interest. We will also speak about ethical and psychological aspects of crowd immunity and that everything will be covered tomorrow at 9 o'clock, the same channels and platforms. Uh, to conclude, as we are on Zoom, Facebook, on YouTube, if you liked what you heard today, we would be happy to see your feedback. Uh, reactions. Uh, the options are there on Facebook. You can have everything. You can have thumb raised. Uh, also other reactions. On YouTube, uh, there is less. It's up or down. Or you can show your like or dislike. And of course, here on Zoom, uh, you can have different reactions. There's quite a spectrum you can use. Um, there are hearts. Uh, also uh, applause. Uh, thank you, thank you. At least there is a good feeling that there are people on the other side and I'm happy for all the positive emotions. So we can do and proceed the same way tomorrow, not only positive emotions but also valuable information which you can use in your work and uh, as a whole uh, to decrease the number of frauds and live in a better life all around us. Thank you for participating uh, in this first day of the conference. We meet tomorrow.